was a very informal uh, event. Uh, it was billed as a round table, but I'm not sure who else is around the table here. <laughs> so we can we can um, chat among ourselves about uh, where we see uh, IoT is going, or if you have any other interesting topics. I threw out a few topics over the last couple of weeks. Um, but welcome anyway to this discussion. My name is Ronan Quillen. I'm delighted to moderate uh, this panel with uh, Siobhan. Um, it's, it's going to be an interesting discussion today um, because IoT is such a wide technology commercial area. Um, we can talk about things like technology trends, what it means for society, what's Ireland's future. If you're an investor in this area, I can certainly give you my pointers because I founded a, a company, of course, in this area and I, I understand very well the financial numbers around it. Uh, so I'm the co-CEO and co-founder of Tauglass. We're an Irish headquarter company. We, we specialize in IoT uh, with operations worldwide over in the US, China, Taiwan. And uh, we do uh, digital transformation using IoT from strategy to design, build, deployment, and services. And we have a big focus ourselves on wireless IoT. Um, so... Uh, and then let's get the other preamble out of the way because there may be folks that don't know what IoT is. So certainly when I talk to my family about it, uh, I, I, especially uh, people that you know not in the, in the industry, they have no idea what I'm talking about. So let's, uh, let's try and explain what, what IoT is from my point of view. So here's my overview of it, okay? And then we'll get going. IoT... Uh, I think stands for right the Internet of Things. But what does that really mean? It's a bit inadequate to describe what is IoT. It's around uh, how it complements our daily lives and society. It's how it interacts with with our life. You know, it, it's about making things easier, more convenient, uh, transforming processes, making uh, better ROIs for companies, and uh, real time intelligence convenience, safety. Uh, in the 15 years that I've started uh, my own business, I've witnessed the change and exponential growth from what might have been called ICT or machine to machine, uh, the, the areas around PC computing, uh, and to the fact that now these devices are embedded in the world around us. You don't need a computer. It's all... It's all embedded in the world around us, and uh, that's how we at Talgas started off with the antenna business. Uh, and I think the big change in the last five years is this: is the rise of this of the cloud. And in fact, the cloud has enabled the true uh, ability to really integrate this tech, this wireless or connected technologies into the world around us. Whereas uh, when we started off, it was what we used to call Thread in the shed, uh, a guy being the in the shed, electronic engineer, designing a couple of boards, simple tracking devices, and now things are way more complicated, way more interesting than that. Um, so, so that's my initial thoughts on IoT before we might talk about certain topics. Um, what do what does the uh, people on the call think about that? And you know, um, before we move into any other topics. Uh, Ron, Hiya. Aiden here, Aiden O'Driscoll, how are you doing? Good. Ron, in the whole area of telemedicine, it yeah. seems going forward, uh, I know COVID has advanced it significantly. IoT is going probably going to have a huge role to play. Yeah. So in, in that particular area, uh, let's let's describe the, what I would say the, the markets for IoT and then and how telemedicine connected healthcare looks in that bigger world. So um, there's probably four, I would say four key markets, four vertical markets today for IoT. You've got industrial, which is your typical factory, uh, automation, vending machines, all that kind of stuff is, is a huge market that's been around forever. And uh, that's all getting uh, this industry 4.0 thing going on. And that's really happening. You've got uh, smart cities, which is your, you know, your smart meters, your smart lights, your smart buildings. Uh, you've got uh, connected health, which is your telemedicine there, and uh, that that has probably the highest growth rate. 
Uh, I was just brushing up on some numbers for today. And uh, it looks like in terms of connected cellular devices, it's a, at least an 18% growth rate year on year uh, easily. And we would see that in our own business. And uh, it's a fascinating area. So in terms of how COVID has uh, has impacted, uh, it's probably accelerated things uh, more than anything. I, I wouldn't say, I think it was happening anyway, but uh, I think uh, I know from working with some startups in the area that um, there's more trials going on. Um, uh, but I think the overall use case was, was always there. In terms of telemedicine, if you're talking about consumer side, uh, sorry, patient side with um, those kind of uh, video interviews, we wouldn't be that familiar with that area. We, we would be looking in our own area at um, connected devices. So that's an area we, we know very well. And the idea is to keep patients out of hospitals. So uh, it's a perfect uh, return on investment. That's the thing with IoT. There's a lot of great ideas out there, but which ones are, which ones can prove an ROI? And uh, the actual, can anyone tell me what the largest, highest volume connected healthcare uh, company is uh, right now? Fitbit. Um, uh, okay, outside of, uh, outside of your end, end user, okay, your typical uh, consumer. I'm talking about uh, m more like a profession because I wouldn't know that as well. Some guys I'd say, but in terms of a, a, an actual medical grade solution, Philips, uh, okay. close, close, yeah. Uh, Philips is is in there, but the the number one is ResMed, you know, and uh, they they do connected um, connected sleep apnea and ventilation. But sleep apnea is is the uh, are the devices, and uh, it's very interesting uh, to see that because they're. Their application is about connected sleep apnea device, you know, those positive air pressure masks to help with people to have uh, trouble breathing at night. Uh, in the US, uh, insurance companies will pay for the patients to use those devices um, at home. And, you know, they're checking whether they're using them or not. And of course, if they're using them, they stay out of hospital. And now if we could have a similar uh, quarantine detection system, I think, uh, we could do very well for COVID, right? Um, so, so there you go. It, it's it's not, and then Philips Respironics is actually number two in that space, but it's in that very specific vertical of sleep apnea, uh, and, and that's the large. Uh, they live, there's literally more than twenty million connected uh, sleep apnea devices worldwide right now. You know, so uh, it pays to do your market research. I think I found. And uh, there are um, market research companies out there that can give you better insight into which which verticals are really uh, happening. You know, not just the hype, but who's actually shipping and volume. That's the way we would look at it. Uh, and are they growing? You know. So yeah, I mean, obviously the, um, the the COVID situation has, has, has seen great demand in in uh, certain aspects of that. Um, I'm heavily involved with an IoT company doing uh, air quality monitoring. Um, which isn't actually detecting the the COVID virus yeah. itself. It's just a, it's just a number of parameters exactly. that would yeah. that would actually um, signal uh, a likelihood of the virus to exist. You know, CO two levels, temperature, um, ventilation, and a few others, uh, um, and provides a statistical indication that this this would be a, a like a breeding ground for uh, potential viruses. You know, COVID included. Yeah. Um, so air quality monitoring, obviously super hot at the moment um, in terms of the IoT space for uh, emerging markets. And that would be either a range of sensors or a, or a singular se a single sensor that can do multiple um, readings. Um, that's That's got a great deal of traction um, in hospitals and care homes and uh, schools and things like that. So there's, but again, you know, how open is the window? I think the, the, the pandemic has obviously... Um, increase people's awareness to air quality. And I think it'll be a hot topic for many years after the pandemic's gone, where people just want to monitor their operational environment, uh, you know, a lot um, with a lot more visibility than they have been before. I mean, I know the Department of Education in Ireland's 
COVID guidelines to schools were open the windows, <laughs> which is obviously fine in the summer. So they have a problem with it in the winter, so they obviously have to find some sort of other solution uh, in terms of um, uh, air purifying and, and yeah. quality filtering and things like that. But I mean, come, coming back, <clears throat> Ronan, to to your three main verticals: industrial, industry, uh, smart cities, and and uh, and connected health. Yeah, and sorry, um, transportation was the fourth. And transportation, right, it's actually right. the biggest of them all. Yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, I, I've got I've got a bit of an insight into. Um, three three of those in industrial industry and transportation and, and silent cities. I can certainly tell you what I'm I'm uh, involved with with my twin brother's engineering company in the IoT. So we are monitoring uh, from the transport side of things, obviously, uh, and this smacks with industrial as well. There's a huge amount of legacy qu equipment out there that was built in the 70s, 80s, 90s that has no form of IoT interaction or capability. And these production plants and these bits of machinery um, are hugely expensive and not going to be replaced anytime soon. So obviously the opportunity for the challenge there is to how do you make it into Industry 4.0? Uh, and, and get it to be able to talk to the cloud. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's a, there's a massive sort of uh, impetus now on CBM, which is condition-based monitoring. Yeah. So to get to the machine before it fails, because a failure costs so much money in, in big, uh, big industry that um, condition-based monitoring is a real, real hot buzzword at the moment for everybody, from yeah. facilities management guys to, to um, you know, JIT uh, production lines and things like that. So the ability to... Um, invent uh, a sensor, whether it's vibration or temperature or, or oscillation or CO2 or whatever. Uh, the, do you, how, can you give us some insight into the sort of innovations you're oh, seeing yeah. I mean, um, at, at sensor level? So, I mean, we, we, have a, we have a business case that if, it's, if there's a request for more than 5,000 units, we will go ahead and build a particular sensor uh, to monitor a particular condition. So, and actually we are overrun with, you know, death by paper cuts of people wanting to monitor very specific things. Uh, and the business case doesn't often um, mar the, the, the sort of uh, the investment required to come up with a sensor. So we kind of put a hard stop at 5,000 5, deployments um, is the minimum that we will do before we actually start looking at tooling yeah. and things like that. Yeah. Um, wow. What, what, yeah, what are you? What are your sort of like business, business issue and business case uh, in terms of uh, where do you want to put your 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 resources? You know, so looking at it from a CEO point of view, I yeah. want to put my resources, my teams, on projects that are, you know, good bets, right? Sure. Uh, and then I will look. You know, this is my own personal view. But I will look at well, is this company a, a leading company in that vertical? Uh, that's very important, um, and it, and therefore, even if the volume is low, you're in there now. You're 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 you've got that beachhead right, cool. and you can really upscale. And ultimately, you know, we would say, you know, well, listen to the listen to those customers. What do they need, and can we can we create value for what they need uh, beyond a single you know uh, widget. single <laughs> widget? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Multiple yeah. widgets is good. And, and, you know, yeah. software and platform. So the more that we can provide to those leading companies worldwide, uh, that's how we would look at a, a towel glass. And of course, you have to pick your your what you're really good at. You know, that's hard. And then you have to really, uh, when you succeed one time, then you get that you you productionize that solution, and you then sell the hell out of that to to the others in the market that may not be aware that this solution exists. You know. Sure. So I mean, do you see, we would approach it. It's very difficult to kind of hammer down a single center production issue because, you know, 5,000, even 5,000 pieces in the world, most most suppliers will just go, you know. No, not not working. I mean, do you, do you see it coming becoming less about the sensors now? I mean, we were all about the hardware when we started, but we were actually becoming like hardware agnostic now and, and, and actually doing it as a data point. So irrespective of what the hardware is required to deliver it, uh, we, we, we are getting a lot of traction in a simple non-CapEx model of 
just rent a data point. We'll supply the hardware. Don't worry about it. Um, and uh, we will give you visibility on this particular pump in the middle of nowhere, or we'll give you visibility on, uh, I mean, an interesting one on transport is um, the, there's two, there's two interesting ones. If, if, uh, if anyone's interested is uh, on the big legacy diesel engines, they have something called a sandbox um, underneath the train. And this thing tips out two or three ounces of sand onto the track. Um, every time the, the machine stops, so the steel wheels can have get traction. Now the sandboxes um, are manually monitored, <laughs> and if the sandbox is empty, the train doesn't run um, because you need the traction from the sand to create the friction uh, to get this big uh, locomotive off the ground. So we are engaged with a number of sort of uh, tacos train operating companies. Uh, to actually monitor a very simple thing, which is the sand, the sandbox, the level of sand in the sandbox, um, and there's 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 great money and, and great scope for it. And as you say, I mean, once we've once we've stuck sensors on the sandbox, we've got a gateway on the train now, um, and now they want to have a look at passenger footfall and door opening functions and things like that. So, the converting the legacy systems um, is is probably. 50% uh, of our business and brand new IoT user cases for new technology. Yeah, well, what is very interesting is every case is unique. You know, if you if you yeah. go out there in the market with your own thing and you think it's the best and your engineers think it's the best, your customer will still say, I need this other thing here. Right? <laughs> so we, we try to uh, build up, you know, toolkits and platforms and bits and pieces uh, and, and say, right, well, here's what we have, but what do you, you know, let's talk about what you want and write it up in a statement of work and, and uh, you know, charge for that because ultimately it's about what, what, the, what the vertical need is, you know, and you'll never know it, we'll never know it exactly the way the customer that's the leader in that industry is. And so what we can do though is to learn as we go along and improve our offerings. So uh, that's, that's how we see it, you know, we, we, um, we we like to kind of listen and draw down, write down the requirements. Have it. It's still very difficult, you know. Uh, the new use cases coming out in the really advanced stuff around machine vision, and uh, you know, you got you need you need machine vision, say, to detect a, an event, right? So you've got to train the the, the camera, right? The, the equipment to recognize that event. Uh, so you got to have people to to record the record what's going on. You got people to tag them. You got to, people to understand what 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 are we looking at. You've got to, the end customer has to help with that. Then you've got to add you got to add four G connectivity to it. You've got to have it in a waterproof little box hanging off somewhere, or it's got to last on a battery for a year. So. So these are the real hard things that have to be solved um, in the big in the big volume scalable projects. You know, uh, that that's where the next gen IoT has happened. That's what we're trying to focus on. So traditional IoT is kind of it's getting there already, right? As you say, you stick a gateway on it, you stick a monitoring device, and it becomes about the software. Um, what we're trying to do is go for the next level up, which is that machine learning, uh, additional human intelligence as to what's going on and then combine it in one in one box you know are you talk, is it is that more about predictive analytics on uh, it, based monitoring or is it is it is it real time, in, in it's real -time decision making for example right. we have a project uh, in the US around detecting uh, how well the container is uh, packed you know uh, our people you know you've got to actually get it you got to so our Polish crew have a container there and they're packing up the container and then they have to record it. They have to train up the, the chip to set and then they have to tag it. Oh, is it 10%? Is it 20%? Oh, that's scratch in the wall. That's not a package. That's a scratch. So this is really interesting, but very hard engineering. Um, but it's real time. It's to say right now, you know, that container wasn't full. Um, uh, and then that will send an alert to uh, the controller. Controller goes here. Hold on a second. Grab an actual video or stop the truck. You know. So, yeah, it's it, it can be so many things. But well, that's what excites me these days. Is that 
Yeah, we'll, oh, probably, yeah. we'll probably stop hogging the airways. Yes, yeah, okay. Do you have a question? <laughs> I, won't, I won't moderate. I, was, I, was gonna... <laughs> I just have to ju jump in here. You know? <laughs> yeah, I don't yeah, want to come across as terribly rude and jump in in the middle of a sentence. <laughs> it's, it's, I think it's first up best dressed in this forum anyway. <laughs> I'm not very good at this. I, I did notice that Eugene had put a question to the chat, but Eugene, you're also on the call, so you can just ask your question. Go ahead, Eugene. Uh, oh, yes. What, oh. Was there one oh, question? Hold on, you're on mute. I, am I on mute? No, 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 not really you're on. Sorry, Eugene was on mute. Uh, there. Eugene's question here, yeah. Okay, you can hear me now, I hope. Yes. Uh, yeah. So, uh, thanks, Ronan. Uh, I just wanted to know, and, uh, you know, we're, we're, I'm uh, working with AIB Seed Fund, We've invested 53 million into over 80 companies. Now, when I look at your own company and when I look at our portfolio, there's nearly always one customer that, that almost makes a company. And I'm just wondering, has that been your experience? Was there, when you look back, was there one customer that was probably hell to deal with? But, uh, you know. The customers like that even now, Eugene. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, but look, they pay the bills. So the um, it would have, we would have started with um, the aftermarket uh, fleet. Sorry, they were aftermarket telematic solutions providers for fleets for the likes of Tesco in the UK. So uh, there would have been two or three small operators of telematics, you know, monitoring fleets. And uh, yeah, they gave us a chance to use our antenna solutions, and uh, you know, they just we ro we rocked up there and we showed them what we had, and they used us. And uh, I'll always I'll always appreciate that uh, you know they gave us that, that opportunity. Um, but but really, um, we were. We set up the business so that we were online sales from, from, from pretty much day one, you know. So uh, that was something that I would have uh, had experience beforehand. That it's important to, when you're starting a business, is to, is to make sure that you're not dependent on one customer for success, you know. Because, uh, so we kind of, if it kind of half answers your question. So yes, there was a few, but none of them were, when I look back on it, None of them were transformational. Um, the, the big move would have been when we set up in the US and then we got the, we got larger and larger US customers. Um, you know, that's where we got the scale. Thanks very much. I'll, I'll let other questions are coming your way. So thanks. Appreciate that. Okay. Hi, Ronan. Uh, I'm here. How are you? Good, yeah. um, my question was a kind of a general one. It was interesting when you mentioned uh, ResMed, because that was Bianca Med, wasn't it? Which was Irish, or at least it's part of it. Yeah. And I was just thinking of that. And then companies like yourself, obviously global leaders, and just to understand how much of it is here, how much is Taiwan. And then there's one or two others like this TechElect, I don't know if you've heard yeah. it, uh, Galway company, oh, just yeah. views, I mean, obviously good companies. And people like Ed Harty's on here, who's yeah. from... Dairy yeah, master who does so I'm just kind of interested in the whole Irish capability and that there's, there's an interesting capability here. Yeah, um, well, ResMed's an interesting one. Um, like I can't say too much about them, put it that way. But uh, a very good, very good company. Very uh, Australia, San Diego, actual headquarters. You know, um, very engineering oriented, but very business business oriented as well. Um, yeah and uh, actually still owned, I believe, and run by the founder's, founder's son. Uh, I think he's got a good Irish name, I can't remember his name, Mick something. Um, but um, very good, very strong, they, they acquired Bianca Med. Bianca Med, yeah. yeah. Um, but ResMed is, a, okay. is like in the tens of billions now, in yeah, market yeah, cap. Yeah. Uh, we, would, we would have obviously known ResMed for many years. Um, so fantastic company, uh, ju it's just an example of who, who's the real leaders. You have to really do your research. Uh, it's, not, it's not some other global brand, it's these, these guys. You know, they're yeah. very good at what they do and they've rebranded their business, I believe, uh, as, as the number one connected healthcare company, you know. Um, so sorry, you mentioned other companies in the ecosystem in Ireland, like would have dealt with, would, would, know, would have talked with the guys in Tech Lec, all right and uh, would respect what they're doing with uh, their 
with their tank monitoring solutions and so on. And, and Ed, Ed Hardy and, and uh, Derry Master have been down there a couple of times. Uh, Ed, Ed, has one, Ed has one of my ex-employees down there uh, and, and uh, doing very well down there. Um, so there, there is an ecosystem, all right. And, uh, it, you know, we are very good at engineering and technology in Ireland. We're really, really good at it. And we're quite uh, dedicated, conscientious, um, you know, when we deliver our solutions compared to some cultures. Yeah. I think that stands to us. And, um, yeah, I, I think we can do a lot more globally, I have to say. Uh, I think yeah. the med the, could be the answer for that, obviously, because we have the really good uh, indigenous and multinational med tech device companies in Ireland now. And uh, they could be the, the real key to scaling up more, you know, larger volume IoT companies in yeah. Ireland, you know. Um, just on the chat here, Philip Hendricks has a question. He says, uh, re remed uh, medtech, do you see any movement on patient power, i.e. when the patient owns their data or signal and may or may not want to share? Uh, we wouldn't see that um, on our side so much, but there are, uh, there's a lot of protocols that go into who is the, who owns the data and how to anonymize the data. So typically, Typically, um, you have to uh, anonymize the data from the devices, uh, and you're not a, you, you cannot you know link the, the patient's data um, beyond whoever the you know that I'm sure that patient doctor confidentiality is, is in there. But typically, the the actual solution providers can get an aggregate. Uh, they get access to the aggregate data so they can do things beyond that, you know, but it's, it's common practice in the industry. Uh, there's always a legal, uh, there's always a lot of legal to and fro about where the, who owns the data, uh, whether it's an American or European uh, customer, you know? So, um, but you have to be very careful in this area and, and you know, any, anybody we do, it, it's the lawyers, uh, have to agree on this area first, you know. Now, typically for an IoT company like us, we don't want to be the ones holding on to confidential data. It's all encrypted and passed on to the uh, whoever should be the data controller, whoever should own it. So nobody else should be able to see that data. Um, what was I going to say? Oh yeah, just uh, we've got about ten minutes left, and we are going straight into a break after this. So if it runs a little bit over, it's not a not a huge deal. But I'm sure people want to get themselves a cup of tea. Um, if anyone else wants to join, please do uh, click their request to share audio and visual up in the top corner. Um, uh, anyone else on the call currently have any uh, burning questions? Where, where do you see the oh, can, Where do you see can, the emerging markets now? I mean, I know um, I'm, 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 I'm addicted to uh, Bob Healy's uh, Mana Drone kind of tweet, Twitter updates at the moment. You know, yeah. he's seen dropping off curries at high altitude around Oran Moor. Um, uh, but I mean, uh, what do you see the next sort of emerging spaces for for IoT? I mean, you could say everything, obviously, but uh, it's, yeah, no, I, I would be very bullish on uh, machine vision. Machine vision. That, that would be the big, the big one for us. I, you know, uh, around AI and vision, uh, and in and audio as well. Uh, smart speaker audio technologies. There has to be very, uh, very new solution use cases around that. If you, you know, the fact that those smart speakers are, you know, coming in everywhere into your home. There's no doubt that the clever people will start to put that into the environment and you as a user can start to interact either with the camera or with audio on a more natural, you know, natural language, natural behavior. So that's what we're looking at is those, you know, underlying technologies. How can we provide um, solutions to integrate into a one box, I call it the one box solution, but you know, adding those extra dimensions of intelligence, uh, and uh, you know, you you shouldn't need to look at a screen to do to do IoT or to do technology. You should just be able to talk, 
or the ca or the or the camera or the sensor should recognise certain behaviours. I think that's the kind of broad vision. And so, machine vision for us is definitely a, a lot of big companies are exploring this right now. And what about the advent of um, um, 5G? 5G is uh, not proven uh, as a kind of uh, applicate a new application enabler yet for I for most verticals yet. Uh, there is a low power element to it, so you should be able to have uh, internet connections to any kind of device potentially for a year. So you should not need to power your your say your connected. Uh, met, I won't say which device. We'll be working on devices like that for that you could use for a year without charging. In and we'll be working with companies in Ireland on that. So that's a, an element of what 5G could deliver. But in terms of uh, the low latency or the high bandwidth, it's still not clear whether those uh, have a big impact yet. You know, um, so low power is the is what is very interesting in the idea. Of you don't need to charge these sensors. You just you know uh, peel and you know just place it somewhere, and it should work for one to five years. That's kind of the holy grail. Ronald, can I maybe ask you a question about scaling? You know, an IoT company through yeah. international partners. I, I have, you know, investments in ICT and IT and software. I, I find that picking international partners can be very difficult. You know, you spend an awful lot of time trying to find the right partner and yeah. it, it can be, you know, good and bad. Most of my experience has been bad in one particular company. How have you found that? Oh, it's... it's uh... It's, it's, it's really hard and it, you have to keep, what is it? You have to kiss a few frogs, isn't it, or whatever, before you find the right one. You know? I don't know what that phrase is, but, but that's true, right? We went through uh, a horrible time uh, where we, we, we went, we scaled up in Europe and we, hired, we got all of these um, agents and kind of smaller distributors. And I didn't follow any processes. They distorted the, the market situation and we got rid of them all, you know? Uh, but it, it was hard to get rid of them all even once you got them in, you know? So, so we have, so we're kind of version 3.0 of our channel management. And Jim, I'm happy to talk to you offline on that. Um, yeah. Basically, you know, it's hard and you, you as, it, as the, if you're the business owner or the CEO, you need to, you need to manage that and be careful with who you bring on as a partner uh, because you, if you can't, if they don't have good processes and a good, a good company culture behind them, they can really screw your, your brand up and, yeah. you know, with your end customers. And that's something we've learned to be very careful. So now we work with, we try to work with global companies that have well-established, they might move slower, but they're not going to uh, screw you around. Thanks. Yeah. And one final thing I have on is remote secure access. Yeah. How yeah. are companies going to start dealing with that? Do you mean you mean in terms of uh, there there I am and I'm I I'm I want to make access into a company using a device. How secure will will the companies be on their side for people trying to get in? Uh, in terms of like an a sensor or something that's yeah. in the building. Um, yeah, so this is a, you know, there's a, there's, there's like three aspects to that security question. There's the, from our, our methodology anyway, you've got the hardware, so you, you have to, you know, harden the hardware, as I say. So you, we have like an encrypted chip that sits in the hardware that um, stops um, rogue, actors uh, getting into the hardware, that hardware is pre-programmed only to connect back to a certain server. So it can't be rerouted, uh, the, tra the transmissions. Then you've got the, uh, you've got this kind of security de uh, development life cycle. So you have to build in the security design processes into your solution from the start. What's the threats? What's the assets that you're protecting? 
and you have to have like a, a review meeting with every time, every with your management team and with your engineering team on new releases. You know, um, and the, I forget what the third one was, but it was it, there's a there's basically an approach needed for security. There, no no device is a hundred percent secure. Uh, that's for sure, right? So. Um, it's a, it, you're always going to have a risk and it's just how do you, it, as our security engineer says, it's a, it's a journey, not a destination. So you just have to uh, ha have that in your processes when you're engineering these solutions and review it constantly um, and, and use the best approaches. So um, yeah, you have to, another key point is to have your, your, your devices must be able to be firm, firmware upgradable over the air. So let's take the analogy of your notebook or your computer. You've got these patches coming through all the time. Your server is being patched. You know, the same thing with your IoT device. You've got to be able to, to, to patch that device as, as new vulnerabilities are, are coming on board. Our security researcher, you know, he goes on the internet and he, he goes on those forums and he tries to find what the latest uh, hackers uh, you know, vulnerabilities are, you gotta be proactive about that. But ultimately, um, cellular is a bit more secure than maybe Wi-Fi or LoRa because you, to a certain extent, you can trust more the security policies of a Vodafone or a, you know, a large global operator than you could uh, somebody just installing a local network. So there's a, there's a lot of layers to that. Um, uh, I think uh, on, on some of our sensitive uh, installs like MOD and the data centers and things like that, where they want to just monitor stuff, they, they won't entertain it at all on their network. You have yeah. to come pre-bundled on your own network, contained. Um, they, won't, they won't lend you bandwidth on their network because they, just, they cannot afford to have yet another door into their network um, from a you know a, a third party that has to look after its own security requirements. So quite often on the more sensitive stuff, uh, we come pre-bundled, all, all doors closed. <laughs> yeah. So that's that's probably the best answer I can give you on that one. Um, um, you, Eugene left a chat or a question in the comments, but uh, just he already had to go. So is there, is there anyone else uh, on the call or in the chat who has any other questions or insights? Um, Aidan McGuinness in the chat asks, any views on IoT and Sigfox? Um, Sigfox is a, is a very interesting um, company and technology. I've actually visited the headquarters there. And, uh, you know, they seem, they have a very good uh, technology for certain applications. I know the guys of ET Networks um, that uh, own the, uh, the Sigfox network and really good guys uh, in Ireland. And uh, they've done very well with uh, certain applications, like I believe it's in the postal service, uh, uh, you know, areas where you can monitor, you know, hundreds of thousands of possibly parcels or, or crates. And that they do it in a much more cost effective uh, solution than any other technology. So you really need to look at your, uh, your application. But I, I, I do rate the technology, but not for all applications. You need to look into um, what are you trying to achieve with it? But the, but the VT guys would be able to tell you that. Hmm. And Dermot Murphy, apologies, Dermot, I missed your question earlier. Um, he asked if you have, do you have any insights into Health Beacon? Um, yeah. Um, <laughs> actually, we actually work with Health Beacon that that it, we have publicised that. Um, you know, great, great technology. Uh, you know, very good leadership there, and. Uh, you know, we're, we, yeah, we're, we're very confident in, in what they're doing. So it's a pretty, I, it seems to be a pretty unique uh, solution and makes a lot of sense. Like I said, we, we've seen what ResMed have done uh, and we can see how LP can really have a global business uh, as they, as they grow. So yeah, bullish on, on, on Help Beacon and, you know, um, I think there's there, there people in there as well are experienced executives and experienced technologists, which helps a lot, you know. Great. Okay. Well, that's just half three now. Um, do we have any, I suppose, any final insights from yourself or anyone else who happens to be on the call? Do they have any, any key insights they'd like to share before we uh, take a break? 
I think that's all for me anyway. Hopefully uh, it was interesting. Thanks, Ronan, very Thank informative. You for, yeah. Thank you all for attending. Yeah, uh, thanks everyone who attended and everyone who put uh, questions in the chat and those of you who joined us on the call. Uh, Ronan, on behalf of HVAN, thank you so much for joining us. Look me up on LinkedIn if you, if you want to talk, okay? Thanks very much, Ronan.